A while ago, I was honored to teach a group of uh, lay people and pastors about how to run worship. And one of the things you don't really think about when it comes to running worship is what do you do with your hands? So you're going to have a quick lesson here. If you ever find yourself in front of a group of people, what do you do with your hands? Everyone stand up. Because if you're in front of a group of people, you're going to be standing. Now, if you don't do anything with your hands, you start waving around and gesturing. And if you all start gesturing right now, it's awkward, right? You start hitting your neighbors, don't do that, right? So obviously you got to do something with your hands. Okay, if you put your hands in your pockets. The thing about putting your hands in your pockets is, A, it's awkward if you're wearing something like I am. And B, as soon as you put your hands in your pockets, what do you do? You slouch. Then you look like you're bumming it. Well, that doesn't work. Now, in high school uh, speech class, you were probably told just leave your hands at your side. Everyone let your hands dangle. Okay, can you just let your hands dangle for 20 minutes? No. So here is the single best piece of advice I've been given on preaching on what to do with your hands. Take your left hand, put it behind your back. You take your right hand and you go... <sighs> <sighs> Are you in there? <laughs> so y'all can grab your hands, right? You can hold your hands behind you. Everyone here? Can you hold your hands? Okay, you may be seated. You now know if you are ever stuck in front of a group of people, if you need something to do with your hands so you know, like, what you're, you know what you're doing, you put your hands behind you and you hold your own hand. Except if you had shoulder surgery, as you all know. And so right now, I can get to about right there. It makes putting a belt on very challenging. And uh, no one's surprised by this, right? Like, no one is surprised that I can't quite get my hand back that far. I mean, my, my bicep doesn't line up like it used to. The whole joint is angry at me, and I'm going to physical therapy twice a week. So this is not a surprise. When we have some sort of surgery or trauma, you lose some range of motion. Things just don't work the same they did as they were before. Things get awkward, like... I got in the car to drive for the first time, and Olivia's been driving everything, so what do you have to do when someone else has been driving? You adjust the mirror. And so I went, oh! It's like the act of adjusting the mirror. Do you think about adjusting the mirror? You don't until you have shoulder surgery. And, uh, and so when you have some sort of trauma, some sort of surgery, you end up just being tense and protective around that. I walked into physical therapy for the first time after surgery, and Laura, the physical therapist here, looked at me and said, Andy, you're slouching, because I didn't want to like hit it. So I was kind of protecting it, so I had to like start standing up straight again. An entirely rational thing to do. And so, many of you have had some sort of surgery or event or something so that uh, you, you know what it feels like, right? It, something gets awkward, and then you have to choose. Am I going to accept the limitation, or am I going to do something about it? Am I going to accept the fact that uh, I can't play, uh, I can't put my, my son on my shoulders, or am I going to do something about it? Uh, the Ratleys were over, you moved, were over for, uh, they usually sit back there. Uh, the Ratleys were over for dinner this last week, and, and so my daughter ran up to Adam, and he just lifted her up to the ceiling, and I can't do that right now. I either need to accept that as a limitation, or i got to do something about it. Because my body is designed to be able to lift my, my daughter up. It is designed to be able to put my son on my shoulders. It is designed to be able to put my belt on, right? <laughs> so what do I do? I go to a physical therapist twice a week. Monday and Thursday, I go out and I go to a physical therapist who knows how the body is supposed to work. Like a physical therapist, what they're trained in doing is they know how hard you can push on a joint and how far it's supposed to move. And they, they'll say, you know what, do this. And does it, is it awkward? Yeah. Okay, do it 15 times. And do it every day and I'll see you next Monday. Thanks. And uh, I've spent a lot of time doing 15 of this and 30 of that over the last month and a half now. And so I've had a lot of time to think about what I'm doing because it's rather boring. And uh, what I've realized is the pastor is the physical therapist of the soul. That's my job, right? I am in many ways the physical therapist of the soul. For just as the physical therapist is the expert on what the body should be able to do, and what do you do to get the body to do that again? 
that's what a pastor is as well. Our, our souls are meant to be joyous, gracious, giving, hopeful, right? And, and when they are not, we show up on Sunday to hear a sermon that shares with us the Word of God that stretches us. Go and forgive your enemy. Is it going to be awkward? Yeah. Do it every day this week. Get back to me next Sunday and we'll do it again. Right? The whole worship service is designed to stretch us. Would you like to be more gracious in giving? I got some plates for you. Right? You want to talk about forgiving each other? We're going to pass the peace in a bit so you can shake hands with everyone. You want to be a little bit more truthful? We're going to have a confession coming up where we're going to be truthful with ourselves. We have fallen short of the glory of God. You want to be more hopeful. We're going to pray. And a prayer is a commitment that the future is in God's hands. And we can have hope in the future. Right? Worship itself is sort of physical therapy for the soul. It stretches us to do what we, we are designed to be able to do. And we can stretch further than we think we can. Right? I lay down on the table... First time I was at physical therapy after uh, surgery, and, and Laura grabs my arm and she starts moving it. <laughs> she starts moving it up, and, and it hasn't done that for a month. And, and I ask as she's moving it up, Laura, ha have I lost any like range of motion here for a while? And she says, while holding my arm up awkwardly, she says, Andy, if you would stop whimpering like you're going to cry every time I move your arm, you'd have full range of motion today. Oh. <laughs> I try really hard not to whimper, and I fail. But she knows how far my arm can move even when I don't think it can. And that's my vocation as well. My vocation is to read scripture and to be able to name what our souls are meant to be able to do even when we don't think they can. To name that and to lead us in doing it, even when it is uncomfortable, even when we start to tense up. Because I gotta tell you, I get really tense. Someone grabs my arm, starts moving it up, I tense right up, and Laura tells me, Andy, you're tense. And I go, No, I'm not. Oh, yes, I am. Right? That's what happens here. I say, We need to forgive folk. And then you think about who we need to forgive, and it's like, Ooh, right? You can do it. You really can stretch further than you think. But what has to happen is we have to lay aside. I mean, Hebrews has this great image. We have to run the race ahead of us. Great. The actual precision of the language is we have to lay aside that which encumbers us, that which is attached to us, like the scar tissue of the soul. What is attached to our souls that gets in the way of us being able to follow after Jesus, the perfecter of our faith, who is leading us on to completion, to perfection, how we are meant to be? What is, a, what is it that is encrusted onto our souls, like barnacles on a ship that drag us down? that gets in the way of us being joyful and gracious and patient and forgiving. Grief, right? Grief can be that, can't it? I'll give you a few examples of what if we, to lay, lay aside, what, what attaches, what's the scar tissue. Grief, the scar tissue after a loss, if it's never worked through, grief can be crippling. Right? To work through it, how do we work through it? Well, one way to work through it is to sing. Can you be, grief, can you be grieving while singing Amazing Grace? Right? To, to sing is to have a moment of joy breaking into our lives. If another thing that can be a sort of uh, a scar tissue of the soul is bitterness. You ever know someone to get bitter? Like they've been hurt time and again, and they've been hurt, and they've been hurt, and they've been hurt. And, and bitterness can become the scar tissue that uh, gets us, makes it so hard to forgive. And to lay aside bitterness and forgive, even though we might, not, we might get hurt again, that is such a challenge. The bitterness there, to, to pray for our enemy is essential as part of that. Scarcity, the fear of not having enough, right? If we're, if we've ha if we're not sure we're going to have enough, how, how can we be gracious? How can we be giving if we're always afraid that there's not going to be enough for us to get by? It can turn into a, a hoarding and a greed. And, and the only response is, is to practice. I mean, you come to the table. Have you ever not had enough at communion? Right? Have you ever run out of communion? Have you ever been ever to a fellowship meal where you ran out of food? Ever. Right? To be here and to practice having plenty. 
Right? Despair. When things have gone just badly again and again and again, that is when we pray and name that we are heading towards God's kingdom, that we're heading somewhere. Right? I say that these are some of them like grief and bitterness, scarcity, despair. There are others. But I hope you get what I'm getting at here. There are things that attach to our souls and we, we respond to them. And I hope we, we can understand that uh, your body is going to slow down, right? There's, no one gets out of this life alive. All of our, our, all of our bodies at some point are going to slow down. But that is not true of our souls. Right? You can be going through physical therapy for your body and there's only so much you can do, but your soul can always be more gracious and patient and hopeful and joyous. And we know it when we see it because we all know people who are as old as old can be and they are beautiful and it has nothing to do with how wrinkled their face is. It has everything to do with the smile, the joy, the response we get when we walk in the door. We, when we walk in and we see people who are joyous, we, that's what we're seeing. The soul that has been going through what Jesus is calling it to do every day. But it is a choice that we have to make. And it's a choice we have to make. Last week we talked about suffering when we deserve it. This week we're talking about the suffering that we, we don't deserve, right? I don't believe there was any moral failing that led to me having shoulder surgery. Right? Anyone here had surgery due to intense moral failing? A knee replacement because you were really evil? No, it just happens. Right? There are people I know who end up with terrible burdens of grief and loss, not because they deserve to have a loved one die, but because we live in a broken world and we share in its brokenness. We don't get to choose whether we will suffer and have scar tissue. Our choice is whether we will let it cling to us and deform us, or whether we will let it go and run the race that is before us. I believe that each of you can run this race in front of you, that each one of you is completely capable of following the footsteps of Jesus and being joyous and, and, and running with purpose and, and abundance and hope. But we don't always do it, and, and, and let's be honest about why not. Right? Let me read you the prayer. I, when I pray in the morning, I get up and I write. Because if I close my eyes and bow my head, you know what I do? I go right back to sleep. So I write. Right? And so I write. I wrote a letter to God the day before my surgery on my shoulder. Here's what I wrote. God, tomorrow I have surgery. In the grand scope of surgeries that happen, this is minor. Yet I am nervous and fidgety. I'm not at all looking forward to tomorrow. I know that I can't continue as I am with my shoulder being this damaged, yet I don't want to deal with the pain of transition. There's a real temptation to just keep on as I have been, even as painful and as awkward as it is. Comfortable. I am somewhat comfortable with how I am, even though I know that tomorrow is the required step towards where I need to be. I'm comfortable here, but I need to be over there. Ugh. Amen. You hear the word in there? Comfortable. Whoo! Isn't that a word, right? You know how that goes. You get comfortable with how things are, even though the scar tissue keeps us tight and hunched and constrained and trying to protect ourselves from being hurt again. We just don't want to deal with it. We get used to how things are, and change is so awkward, right? Comfortable. It is an act of faith and trust to change because we don't want to endure the transition costs. It's easier to stay at odds with the family member than to make the phone call and start rebuilding. It's easier just to stay away for Thanksgiving than to go to Thanksgiving and go through the, the, the weirdness of trying to get it back right. Mm -hmm. it, it's more comfortable to stay silent than to take a breath and to sing and, and put, throw yourself into worship again. It is easier to stay where we are than to step out and do what is uncomfortable. It's not better, it's not healthier, it's not right, it's not what we should do, and we know that's the case, but it's more comfortable, and we are, we're suckers for comfortable. But it's worth it. This entire sermon series started a few years ago when I was talking to someone uh, I was at a conference. This guy was helping out at a conference. And, uh, and, and we were, started chatting. And, and he said he started... How did, how did he get into this? And he said he started helping out th these type of events after his wife died. 
and his wife died, and his wife, and his wife was everything to him. And, and, his, his pa and he was just stuck. He was stuck in that grief. And, and he heard a sermon a few months later, and his pastor said, serve till it heals. Right? Serve till it heals. And, and he took the pastor seriously. He went out there and started serving. And if you think about what an act of courage that is, because this guy had been comfortable with him and his wife, and that's how they did things. And to go out by himself, right? to go out to eat by himself, to go to church by himself, to go help by himself, to go start doing things by himself after 40 years of doing everything with his wife. You know how comfortable it is? But he took that risk. And I met, when I met him, he was surrounded by his church family, and he was smiling, and he was having a great day. It was just wonderful, right? But he risked being uncomfortable, stretching further than he thought he could, because that's what it took to run the race set before him. It is true that our bodies will all eventually be constrained, whether we are comfortable with it or not, but it is not true of our souls. We can grow in joy and hope all the days of our lives, if we're willing to do what is uncomfortable, if we're willing to be stretched. And so I invite you today, as I will invite you every Sunday, to be uncomfortable for Jesus. So stretch further than you think you can. It is my fondest desire, my deepest hope, that each of you may leave every burden behind and run the race set before you, that filled with joy you might stride towards the fulfillment of our hope, the fullness of the kingdom of God, such that when you arrive, you have been strengthened by the journey are told, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen.